Coming up on Windows Weekly, Leo's out, but I'll fill in along with Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley to talk about Microsoft making lots of money in the last quarter, the upcoming Nokia World Conference, and a whole lot more. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley, episode 231, recorded October 21st, 2011. Why can't we just shoot things? Windows Weekly is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. Go to Assist Express by Citrix puts IT professionals in position to do what they do best: access, diagnose, and resolve. Try it free for 30 days. Visit gotoassist.com/windows and buy Newegg. The Newegg gadget trade insight powered by Gazelle. Trade in your used gadgets today at newegg.com/trade and receive a Newegg gift card. That's newegg.com/trade. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything to do with Windows, including squeegee, squeegees and, you know, as chamois and... No, I'm being told it's about Microsoft Windows? Okay. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. I'm Maya's actor. I'm covering for Leo Laporte. I'm joined by Paul Thorat, news editor, proprietor... Fancy man about town of uh, Windows Supersite or WinSupersite.com. How's it going, Paul? Fancy man. I am a fancy man. You're a fancy man? Looking I'm in, good. In a fancy you hotel are. room? Unless you I change your office. Did you change your office to look like a hotel room? No, I'm visiting Washington, D.C. this weekend. Just a personal visit? Or are you lobbying Yep, just a personal visit. I've only been away for the last six weeks in a row, so I figured I'd tack on a couple more weeks of travel. What the heck? Fancy. Very fancy. And... and Equally fancy, Mary Jo Foley, joining us from allaboutmicrosoft.com. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm not in a fancy location. I'm just at home. I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite lovely, I think. So. Fancy. Okay. Maybe not fancy. <laughs> so I'm here with the fancy and lovely folks, and uh, I'm just at the Twit Studios. So we're not, we're not doing anything too crazy. Let's talk about actual Microsoft stuff. Microsoft released earnings this week. Uh, the quarter was actually better than was expected. I think the estimates were something like $17.25 billion, and Microsoft showed the street. They said, we're going to make $17.37 billion. Take that. Uh, so they did pretty well. And it turns out that Office 2010 is doing pretty well. And Bing, Bing continued to lose money. Is that right, Paul? <laughs> uh, it loses less money. That's a, that actually is a success. <laughs> it's a market success. This is, uh, this is what I call making lemonade, you know? So, so yes, it's, it, it is still losing money. What are, what are the highlights of the Microsoft earnings report? So actually, I, I, I suspect Mary Jo has a similar list of things. I, I went through their earnings report, and more important, I think, their, uh, you know, that conference call that they have after the fact, which is very interesting. And, and I, I pulled out some factoids that I thought were really interesting. You know, um, one of the things has to do with the Windows PC sales. You know, everyone is talking up how, you know, iPad growth is... Um, you know, is really up there, and the sale of PCs is not so is not so great. Although it's it's really the it's not that the PC industry isn't growing because it is in fact growing. It's just growing at a much slower pace than say the iPad or tablet market, which makes sense because it's 35 years old um, and is obviously a very mature market. But Microsoft had some interesting statistics in there, including that business PC sales grew five percent to a quarterly record, according to them, of almost 35 million PCs. And that consumer PC sales overall were flat thanks to slowing netbook sales, which I think you can partially attribute to, um, to the iPad, certainly. But interestingly, if you factor out netbooks, sales of Windows to consumer PCs actually grew 14% in the quarter. And I, I, I mean, I find that kind of amazing. You know, they actually experienced double digit growth with consumers on what I would call normal PCs, you know. So I, I think, you know, I just find it interesting every time Microsoft comes out with this uh, kind of a quarterly financial report, you know, people will look at Windows lately and they'll say, oh, you know, they only grew to, you know, 2% Windows division. Um, you know, oh, you know, iPad's having this big effect. And obviously the iPad is this kind of a new market and, and obviously the, the, the general purpose computing market is changing. 
Now, what, do you, um, what do you attribute this this kind of gain to? I mean, is, is there are there ads actually working where they're like, go get a new PC because we're going to turn your house into a Windows store? This is a very odd commercial that's been running the past. Yeah, I want to be really clear about this. There is absolutely no way those ads are working. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that there are going to be two things going forward that will make a difference. Uh, one is the appearance of these MacBook Air-like computers. I think those will make a small difference, you know, Ultrabooks. And, and I think they'll make a bigger difference from sort of a financial perspective. Because the problem with netbooks was always that netbooks helped improve the unit sales uh, aspect of things, but not the actual money that was being earned by the industry because netbooks were just a, a zero-sum game. Um, and the second one, of course, is going to be the release of Windows 8. And one of the things that I think Mary Jo brought up a few weeks back on this podcast was the possibility that Microsoft's partners would allow consumers to buy these tablets that were aimed at Windows 8 but would ship with Windows 7 and that in the future, um, you know, you'd get a free copy of Windows 8 because you bought this thing early. And, and that is particularly interesting to me. And I, I, I think... Short term, you know, maybe those two things will have a, a small positive impact, I guess, as as netbooks, you know, uh, continue their inevitable slide. Mary Jo, do you have any theories as to why window sales are up? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, one thing I heard on the conference call, and this isn't so much about consumer as it is about business, but um, somebody asked during the Q&A part, you know, how, how far along are you guys, Microsoft, in seeing corporate deployments of Windows 7? And they said, we're at the midway point. Um, so that means there's still a lot of um, uptake coming for Windows 7 on PCs, um, especially from larger corporations. So, you know, I, I was like, yeah, okay, consumer demand, it, as people are portraying it. But the real demand, I think, is coming from um, businesses right now who it takes them a lot longer to deploy an operating system because they have to do the testing and all. Um, so that's where they're kind of seeing the real growth, I think, and and what they're playing up when they say there's still a lot of life left in Windows, in I Windows 7. I wonder if, if, if the, uh, the actual announcements of cutting support for Windows XP and saying, look, it's 10 years old, move on. Is that enough to say, look, people, you have you to know, go you know out what? there? I don't think so. Um, and the reason is, I, I, you see, you see and no, but here's why. Um, Microsoft will very frequently bring up this aspect that, you know, Windows XP is ending uh, support, but it's ending support in two years or something. I mean, it's not. Exactly. It's not happening. Twenty fourteen. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. They always bring up this milestone. You know, there's only uh, twenty eight months left in uh, Windows XP or whatever the figure is. You know, twenty eight months. It's like, <laughs> I mean, it's you know, that's the time. lifetime of an entire <laughs> Mac OS ten version. What do you mean? Like this thing's going to be around forever. <laughs> yeah. So I agree. I, I don't I know. Totally agree. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So the ads aren't know. working. It's not because they're threatening. It's because of. <laughs> enterprise uh, yeah so i would say that you know mary joe talked about the, the the corporate deployment stuff and um I, I think that that's always been microsoft's bread and butter and the nice thing for microsoft in a way is that these people don't do things all in one lump time you know they they do them very slowly and even though microsoft will uh, they'll, they'll have these figures you know x percentage of the fortune 500 is deploying windows 7 you know doesn't mean that they are deploying windows 7 to all of their pcs it means they're deploying windows 7 to some small group of pcs perhaps but they will do more and more of those things over time so that provides them with a kind of a healthy chunk of Windows 7 unit sales every quarter, no matter what, you know? And so I think that benefits them in the long run because when, when a new system comes out, whether you're Apple or Microsoft or whatever, people buy a bunch of them right away as individuals, but it's the businesses that maintain that kind of a healthy, steady sales rate over time. And I think ultimately that benefits Microsoft uh, very strongly, even though it's not that exciting from a news perspective. You know, uh, Windows 7 sales have been very consistent since that product was released. I think it's because of the way that these businesses do things. And so, you know, ultimately that's a plus. Now, I haven't heard much about Windows Phone 7.5 in this or Windows Phone at all. I mean, I've seen the financials yeah. out there and it seems like they kind of buried it a bit. Is, is there any, anything of note with Windows Phone uh, with, this, with this quarter? Not, no. not really. Um, <laughs> but you know, okay, you know what I want to talk about in earnings? Because I think this was kind of glossed over in a lot of the reports that I read. You know, the, the real star of this quarter, Microsoft's quarter, was Office. Yep. And to me, that was hugely surprising because remember when Microsoft launched Office 2010, everybody was saying, oh yeah, that thing's not going to sell. You know, Google, everybody wants Google Docs. No one wants Office on the desktop anymore. So in this... This past summer, they announced, we've sold 100 million copies of Office 2010, by the way. 
And this quarter, they sold even more. They're not putting out the new numbers, but um, they're selling to businesses, they're selling to consumers. And they also said during the Q&A, um, there's like this virtuous circle happening. Um, Office 365 sales, you know, which is their office in the cloud, it are helping them sell more office on the desktop and vice versa. Um, so it's kind of defying all the doomsday predictions that everybody had about office. You know, they're selling more link, uh, unified yep. communications, they're selling more exchange, they're selling more SharePoint. And it's it's just exactly the opposite situation of what so many people predicted. And do you think um, yeah, so there's it, 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 no accounting for this? Well, wait a minute. Now, it could be that, that, I mean, a lot of people want to put a lot of stock into clouds, right? They're like, oh, yeah, everything yeah. could be here. But when there's one outage, your productivity absolutely is shot unless you have like a plug in for your browser. Well, okay. But so you're saying that the office sales are attributed to a chicken little effect with the cloud computing failures that Microsoft may be orchestrated on purpose <laughs> to make its office suite sell better? Is, is that the. That's a great leading question. And I'll, <laughs> I'll say <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Paul's wearing a tinfoil hat right there. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I am in D.C., so. <laughs> You're ready to do all um, the conspiracy theories. No, but I, I think it's really, it's, it's what was just so interesting to me is it's, it is defying logic in a way. It's, and I don't know if it's logic so much as, as predictions, but, you, you know, it's showing there's still a lot of life left in Office on the desktop. So, so many people are, again, predicting as we're going towards the next version of Office that, oh, you know what, Microsoft's not going to sell any Office 15. It, you know, everybody wants the cloud and nobody wants Office on the desktop. I think they're the going to prove them wrong again. Yeah, you know, is this the last version? You know, is this the you know the last version of Windows they're ever going to make? Is this the last version of Office? You know, like, come on, guys, seriously. You know, between uh, all this on-prem software that Microsoft makes, Windows, Office, and Windows Server Plus tools represents 85% of the company's revenues right now, 85%. Um, Office is a bigger business than Windows. Office grew more than Windows and, and earned more revenues than Windows, which isn't um, actually all that unique. They've always been kind of neck and neck, but Office has been ahead for the past couple of years. Um, Office sales in this quarter are up from what they were a year ago, which is particularly amazing because a year ago they released that new version. And that, like I said, that's typically when people tend to buy those things, you know. But instead what you see, let me see if I can find the number, was something like, um, yeah, 7% growth with consumer attach rate, meaning uh, you get office with a new PC, and then business sales were up 3%, but 7% over what was sold a year ago when this thing was brand new. It's just, it, I don't want to say it's unprecedented, but it's surprising. You know, it, we, one of the weird themes I think we've had on this podcast over the past year is this notion that people believe things that sound like they make sense, you know, even though there's no evidence to support them. And this, this is like the opposite of that. You know, if you had said, you know, office sales slid 15% year over year because, you know, it's a year and a half later and that kind of makes sense. People would nod that, yep, that makes a lot of sense. You know, office sales went up, you know, in a year and a, a 15 months after they released a new version of the product. I mean, that doesn't, it almost doesn't make sense, you know, but that is what happened. Now, so the office is doing really well and everyone uses wor uh, Word. Nobody uses Word perfect. And I think Novell is suing uh, Microsoft, <laughs> an old, old case, and Bill Gates is going to be on the stand again. Is that, is that right? I, I realized after the fact that I had ruined my chance to write an awesome headline like, you know, testify like it's 1999 or, you know, one of those kind of things. But, uh, yeah, you know, if you follow news feeds online, you know that every once in a while there'll be some kind of a screw up. And what will come through on the news feed is a story from like the year 2000 or the year 2004. And it's completely out of whack with what's going on in the world. So when I started seeing these stories about Bill Gates to testify in antitrust hearing, I thought, you know... Clearly, the RSS feed is broken here, but actually, um, that's not the case. <laughs> so it's actually going to happen. There's some old famous footage of Bill Gates being a little bit, what's the word, um, combative, maybe? Or <laughs> oh, I, Stubborn? Well, I, 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 it's a weird combination of falling asleep and combative. I'm not sure what to call it. It's uh, Cranky. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. He's a little tired, maybe a little hungry. He uh, doesn't want to be testifying about it. I, I, you guys think we're going to see oh. the same Bill Gates or we're going to see a mellowed out? He's, you know, he's a lot it's older now. He's a, ph a philanthropist. He's <laughs> saving the world and ridding the world of malaria. You think he's going to be as standoffish? No, no, but I think his, his claim of not remembering is going to be a little more realistic this time. Let's put it that way. It's been he, <laughs> These events date back to 1994, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you know, 16, 17 years later, whatever that is, um, I, I mean, can you tell me what you were doing in 1994? I mean, I... I, <laughs> I think I was entering no ninth grade. 
or 10th grade. Yes, yeah, um, exactly. So. Let's see, what else are they doing? I wasn't some doing this, I wasn't testifying. I agree with that, some people wouldn't. What's your opinion? I think we are the most, if you took, took it on a statistical basis, yes, we'd be the most respected software company. <laughs> I, I told this story. I think Mary Joe might have been around for this. Certainly, Leah was. But, you know, in the wake of that, uh, all that uh, the testifying that he did, and also not just him, I think Steve Ballmer as well. Um, Microsoft offered the press the opportunity to get the full set of tapes, and they were tapes, VHS. You could choose between VHS and Beta, believe it or not. And um, I did. I, I got them, and uh, it, they're unwatchable. Uh, it, it is hours and hours, and I think there were, there were do a dozen of these tapes or more. I don't remember anymore. I threw them away. You know, you would I could plumb through these things, and maybe there'll be some interesting details in there. And then what happens is you, it's it is a strange mix of you. You're falling asleep and you're aggravated. <laughs> you know, it's just they're unwatchable. Do you think Microsoft will release it in Silverlight and in HTML5, the, the next set, or, or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'll be in Flash, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Bill Gates well, testifies that makes sense, 2011. Considering Windows 8 Metro does, I mean, not Windows 8, Windows 8 uh, Metro IE doesn't play Flash videos, so people won't even notice it next time it comes out. I like it. Nokia World's um, coming out. But you out. know, that, what's, what's what? crazy about this whole suit, right, it's, it's like, okay, so let's say they win. Let's say Novell wins. And then what? I know. I know. <laughs> because, you know, when this case originally was brought, it, there was yeah. some relevance and... and you could see, okay, Novell said Microsoft withheld interoperability information that Novell needed to make its products compatible with Windows. Okay, mm -hmm. then Novell sold WordPerfect to Corel, right? <laughs> so, like, Novell didn't even well, own it anymore, yet this case is going forward. I, I think there's it, also it, a case like, to be made. Uh, Novell was much like Netscape in that, yes, Microsoft certainly undertook some actions that harmed the company, but a lot of the harm was self-harm. You know, and, and Novell certainly did no favors to the WordPerfect product. I, I actually was working in a uh, at a community college and supported Novell, uh, at, well, I'm sorry, WordPerfect at the time, which was run by Novell. And I remember having to deal with those people and, and what that was like. And I actually feel like Novell was one of the worst things that ever happened to, no, uh, to WordPerfect because it basically put the product in a holding pattern at the worst possible time during this big Windows transition. And that was the end of that, you know, and not that maybe Word wouldn't have beaten it otherwise, but, you know, that was, it was just uh, horrible timing, you know. I'm just trying to think what the court could do to make Novell feel whole. I mean, that's usually what you do in court cases. Are they going to have... <laughs> I like uh, the Bill Gates is on the or, screen above you, by the way. It's good. Yes, we, we just installed this beautiful <laughs> screen back there. The bezel We were just joined so by a younger Bill Gates. <laughs> we just seated him up the, like the judge. I, Your Honor, that's what it seems like back there. Uh, but anyway... <laughs> Like I was saying, to get Novell whole, I would think they would, would they just give uh, the company like a bit of royalties for Word? I mean, how could they possibly make Novell relevant or happy, I guess? I the think they the should day? give uh, Novell free Word licenses that they can dole out to their employees. Just use this. Here you go. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> this has everything you wanted and more. Yeah. And then it will be, but it will be for like Word 2003 or something. <laughs> With no, with, actually, I think Word 2003 still had support for Word, uh, for Word Perfect, or like the little Perfect. help feature wow. where it would say Word yeah, Perfect yeah. help for. Oh, you, you you could probably still this day. I've never I haven't looked, but you could make the screen blue with white text on it. You know, just because that's somehow. Oh, more there you familiar. go. That's the customized version that they will, that, that Microsoft will put out to make yeah. Novell very happy. <laughs> Let's talk about Nokia World. <laughs> that's coming up what in a couple of days actually, and yeah. uh, the the Nokia phones seem to be leaking out. I mean, the Nokia, I think it's the N800. Is that what the, the C-Ray is going to be known as, I think? And it's got three blazing, awesome colors, like pink and blue and green. What's the third one? I don't remember. Black. Yellow? Is it black? <laughs> I don't White. know. So are, are, are you guys psyched about Nokia World? Or right, Mary, yeah. Mary Joe's going. I'm going. I'm going to London on Monday. Yep. So I am psyched. Um, I'm going to be really curious to see what we actually see there. Because there are all these, there's so many Nokia code names right now. I mean, I do a code name tracker for Microsoft. If I was doing one for Nokia, it would be like a multi-page document, right? <laughs> and what we don't even know is, are these code names referring to the same phones? How many phones are there? Are there two? Are there five? We don't really know. Um, so we know, we, we believe we're going to see the C-Ray next week, which is the um, supposedly the 800. 
Um, then there's this thing called Sabre, which we may or may not see, which may or may not go, go on sale in November, like everyone's expecting the C Ray 2. Then there's all these other code names I've seen floating around too. So uh, I, I, you know, what, what's interesting is Steve Ballmer said last week at the Web2 Expo that Nokia is going to show a bunch of phones running Windows Phone at Nokia yeah. World. And a bunch he gets is to more say than that one. and not get fired, right? <laughs> Unlike some other people at Microsoft, um, who, if they say anything about Windows Phone, um, <laughs> I think I've seen. I, I mean, know I've seen a bunch nothing. Of leaks. You, so you know nothing. <laughs> I'll talk about the leaks I've seen because I can't get in any trouble for this because I just checked on the internet and I saw these things. And I think the potential for Saber was a uh, theoretically a curved glass screen. I think T-Mobile or, or Deutsche Telekom put up a, a giant poster in a window by accident, <laughs> which was quickly removed. Nice. So uh, it talked about a curved screen, had like a, a, I think it was about four inch display. I, it was a couple of weeks ago. And then there yep. was another leak of a white Nokia phone, uh, running Windows uh, 7.5, a Windows Phone 7.5. These are really poorly kept secrets at this point. I, mean, I, I guess they're just waiting for the splash. And I think during the Asia D conference, Andy Lee's is like, oh yeah, you'll see the full roadmap next week at Nokia World. So, yep. <laughs> so if you were wondering. Well, it, it, the big question I have as a resident of the United States is which phones will be available on which carriers and when, you know. And, and frankly, this is kind of a problem with Windows Phone in general right now where, you know, I think we know as of today exactly what's going to be available on AT&T, I guess. That was something that Andy Lee's, I believe, discussed the other day. But, you know, I wish there was some, I don't know, clarity or transparency or whatever you want to call it around you know, which phones, which carriers, when. And and hopefully this Nokia World event is maybe what everyone's waiting for and, and that will be the trigger. But, uh, you know, this it's it's just odd to me. that There's so many questions around, you know, when when and where and, and all that stuff. And I, I, I wish there would be more clear about that. I, yeah. thinking, no, I mean, it, it's good. I was going to say, Andy Lees did say, okay, we're going to have these three phones on AT&T. I think he said the the new Focus, the Titan, and I'm yeah, forgetting. And the, the other one. Samsung, whatever the, yeah. The other Samsung, yeah. But I think it's no, two Focus phones, when? basically. Right. So, and Verizon, forget it. You're on Verizon? Yeah, we don't know anything at all. No, we so. don't know anything, and that's the thing. So, I, I hope Nokia, it would be so tragic for Nokia World to come and go without some hint of where these phones are going to end up, in the U.S. especially. Well, the big thing about Nokia is, that, can they leverage their relationship with Microsoft to actually have subsidized phones again? I mean, the thing is, Nokia yeah. phones always suffer because they cost like $500. You have to buy them off contract, and they were running yep. an operating system that, well, they had that Amigo one for a little bit. That was a fun one, the N9. Uh, but they had an operating system that was is going to be dead in, well, in a long time, five years. 2016 is when uh, Symbian is going to be dropped. But everyone knows the future for Nokia is Windows Phone anyway, so they're probably waiting on that. And if Microsoft yep. can get these guys a subsidy with AT&T and other, com and other uh, carriers, I mean, they'll be relevant again, hopefully. Because otherwise, if they, if, yep. if they don't announce a subsidy a subsidized version of these phones at Nokia World for the United States, they're pretty much dead in the they water. Ha they have to. That's, yeah. the, that's the realism of the modern smartphone market. They have to. They, they can't come into market and say, you know, you buy this thing up front and then you still have a monthly fee. Um, no. They, I mean, they have, to, they have to do it the normal way. They have to. Yeah. The, other, the other thing I'm hoping we get to see besides the phones at Nokia World is I'd love them to give an update on what's going on with the Skype client for Windows Phone. Like, wouldn't it yes. be cool if they said, guess what? Here it is. And you can get it now. And we even have so some let me phones see, with see if I can find this. We, we talked about, you know, Microsoft completed their purchase of Skype last week and then they said nothing <laughs> about Skype. But one of the things that was in that conference call was they said Microsoft, they actually mentioned specific products where Skype will be integrated and and they use the word integrate, right? So they're going to integrate Skype across its portfolio of products and services, included, including Link, Windows Live Messenger, Windows Phone, and the Xbox platform. Yep. Those are all, you know, fairly obvious. But I believe that's the first time they ever really spelled it out like that. So um, saying they're going to do something is like saying Christmas will occur sometime this year. I mean, it's going to happen eventually. But I, I, hopefully what they mean by that is within, their net, within, this, coming fisc I'm sorry, within this current fiscal year which runs through the middle of next year uh, from a calendar perspective. So hopefully soon, but yeah, definitely. I, it would be awful yeah, for this to come and go and not to have answers to questions like these. 
Do you think Microsoft yeah. would let that kind of announcement go at Nokia World, or would they hold it off for CES for their own presentations and keynotes? I, I, I wonder, I mean, they have a pretty close relationship, obviously, <laughs> because Stephen Elop's running Nokia, but yeah. do, do you think that Microsoft would be okay with introducing a new Skype functionality at, at, this, uh, at Nokia World? Well, I think I think there's two levels of Skype functionality for Windows Phone. So there's going to be a client, right? And I think that's the thing that they could show and talk about because earlier this year they said when Mango is released, we're going to have a Skype client finally for Windows Phone. But then the integration like Paul's talking about, I think they would keep that for their own show like CES or something along that lines. Yeah, and for some future version of Windows Phone, whatever that yeah. is. Right. So let's see, Microsoft and partners are pushing out firmware upgrades next week, fixes for, wait, Zunes are freezing? Like actual Zune hardware or Zune software? No, so, the, <laughs> Alex I know, know, it's so like confusing. <laughs> um, no, the Zune service is freezing on some handsets. I think all, only HTC handsets. Um, but then there are all these other weird rogue problems that people are reporting, like the disappearing keyboards, uh, soft keyboards on some Windows phones. That's, that actually seems to be a very prevalent problem. <laughs> oh, that, that's not a good thing. That's, no. That's great. And so, you know, next week they say they're going to push out some firmware updates that are unique to different carriers. And so what people think are in those updates are uh, some of the drivers for tethering support. But I'm also curious if, it, if it fixes for any of these problems are in there too. And I've asked them and haven't gotten an answer yet. Now, Steve Palmer said Microsoft wouldn't make its own phone, but wouldn't that solve a lot of this? Because they didn't have to worry about driver <laughs> issues running into hardware problems. Yeah. And like, I mean, the Xbox 360, although that thing red ringed, uh, had a bit of problems. Uh, when Microsoft makes its oh, own phone. Oh, did hardware, it? I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> you have not been paying attention to the internet. I think Android. I sent six of those things back, by the way. Oh, wow. So, should yeah. Microsoft get back into the phone biz? I mean, they own Danger no. still. Uh, they made the no. Kin. No, no. You, don't want, you don't want Kin 2? Nope. Nobody wants no, to No, uh, they won't because, uh, well, first of all, they have this special partner in Nokia. They also have a, a somewhat special partner in Samsung. And that, by the way, that was another thing that was in that document around their earnings. You know, they, they talked about their special collaborative or, uh, relationship with Samsung, where Samsung is also contributing code to Windows Phone going forward, much in the same manner that Nokia is. And Microsoft has alluded to this in the past a little bit, right around the time that they made that uh, cross-licensing, you know, the patent cross-licensing agreement, I think back in August or September, whenever that was. Um, you know, so I, I think what they're establishing is this kind of next best thing to you making it yourself, is that you're working with a hardware maker to make the hardware. You know that, you, you know that Microsoft is probably working very closely with Nokia on their designs as well. And um, I think that that's actually a better solution for this kind of a platform than just doing it yourself. But Paul, don't you think they could do something like Google's doing with the Nexus? Like, why not? Like, why not have yeah. third parties and have your own phone that's like the reference design? So yeah. this is a, this is a chicken and egg thing, I think, that occurs here where Microsoft's special relationship and now special relationships may end up scaring off some of the other partners. And I, I just think that this platform is too fragile to support that, that if Microsoft were to go, unless, of course, they just picked HTC for something like that, which would be hilarious. But, I mean, <laughs> it, it, I, just, I just think it would harm the relationship too much right now at a point where, you, you know, it's a tough justification. Microsoft can't strong arm these guys. It's not like they're selling millions and millions of these phones. So uh, they could. I just don't think they will right now, you know, for political reasons. Um, yeah. That I think said... I yeah, I, I think, Sorry. you know, the, the rollout that they did of Mango in terms of, you know, how well that's gone. And now it's out to pretty much everybody as of this week. You know, the, yeah. the distribution of that shows that they can make the partner ecosystem work. But then when I hear the mm -hmm. reports of things like the keyboard problem and the Zoom freezing problem, um, back, some people reporting battery life problems, some people not. I'm like, you know what, maybe they should just make a reference design because it's so yeah. hard to well, actually support all this. Arguably, Windows Phone already is a reference design of sorts, right? I mean, they—they, yeah. they, you know, they're very specific about the hardware. The question I have about all three of those issues that you just mentioned um, is, where's the problem, right? Is this some bizarre firmware-related hardware-specific problem that is, you know, in other words, there's an all the HTCs have battery problems, you know, or only the HTCs have this Zune problem. Does that mean that there's a problem with the OS software? Or is there a problem where 
those guys may be in some way strayed too far from this reference design that Microsoft kind of does have, you know? I don't know. And I, I don't think we're ever going to hear for sure. I, there's no way that either company involved would ever admit that it was one or the other thing, right? They're not going to come out and say what it was. So there's no way to know, but I, I don't know. I, I just don't... I, I think if Windows Phone takes off, uh, th that would be one thing, and that would enable them to be able to do this thing. But I think right now they're kind of treading on eggshells, especially with these companies that don't have a special relationship. And once you get past Nokia, Samsung, HTC... Well, is there anyone else? I mean, is there any other major player that has announced seven five phones? Oh, uh, well, aside from that one Chinese company, or I mean, who, who else GTE, is out there? Right. Yeah. GTE, yeah. yeah. Sony Ericsson, maybe. Or is Sony. Maybe right. Is Dell gonna? You know, Dell had a really nice Dell's first gen the phone, game. but they've been Dell's silent. Out. Mm -hmm. so they're out. Yeah, okay, I mean, they so. might be back in for Windows Phone eight, but they're out for yeah. Mango. Well, maybe Rim should just j jump on board. They they need some help. <laughs> they should go to Windows Phone seven. Because that's the way to go. I, I, yeah, I mean, RIM, unfortunately, is, is <laughs> reaching a precipice where, uh, you know, a year ago, you could have made this argument that they would have had really good contributions to make to this kind of platform. And now you're thinking, yeah, they're just going to drag us down with them. You know, I mean, I, I don't know that RIM is in, I think RIM's in a tough spot. You know, RIM is in the same spot that Nokia is in, except that Nokia, of course, has an answer for the next generation. Whether it's right or not, we'll find out. But they at least have a plan. With Nokia, you get the feeling that every two weeks the plan changes, and we don't really know what the heck's going on. Even after their developer show that they just had uh, this past week, I, I sort of walk away from that thinking, I don't know what the heck these guys are doing. I, I, I really, I don't see clarity there at all. We have to take a small break for our sponsor. Uh, this episode of Winners Weekly is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. Now, you know, there, there are two things IT professionals and their clients have in common. They want the job done right, and they want it done fast. That's why we recommend Go to Assist Express by Citrix to anyone in IT. It puts clients at ease with its simple and secure remote support and puts you in position to do what you do best, which is access and diagnose and then resolve actual problems. It's an easy and fast way to connect you to your clients, letting you work quickly and accurately. You can even fix the problem without being there in person. You can view other, another computer online and control it so you can resolve technical issues quickly. Even work while your customers are away from their computers, which is always a good thing, uh, dramatically boosting your productivity and that of your clients. Try Go to Assist Express free for 30 days. Visit go to assist.com slash windows. That's go to assist.com slash windows. So let's see. Speaking of windows, that's what we do on this show. Uh, Windows <laughs> Intune 2 released. Uh, well, actually, before we jump to Windows Intune 2, is there any other Windows Phone stuff we want to cover before we move around? Anybody? No. I'll I think, there's a no. I think we should all be hyped. <laughs> so, we're going to be talking about it a lot. Okay, next so yeah, week. next week there'll be a lot more about Windows Phone 7, but let's talk about Windows Intune 2, which has me confused because I thought Windows Intune 1 just came out, or it wasn't 1, it was just Intune. Wasn't it like a couple just months Intune. ago, Paul? Yes, uh, seven months ago, I want to say. Yeah. Which is, you know, part of what's amazing about this, that they, you know, Microsoft is committed to doing this online service thing and doing it right. And, and that means, of course, updating the service on a fairly regular schedule. So, you know, here they are yet again. So I, I think the other aspect of, of Intune that's really interesting to me is that they've been very open, and this has been true uh, all along, about their desire to press ahead in the future very quickly as well. And not just make this thing as full-featured as their on-premises PC management products, which are basically the system center products, but also to make them superior to system center and less expensive. Um, and that's, you know, for, for a company like Microsoft, it's a fairly aggressive way to speak, especially when they're basically competing with their own um, uh, products, you know, internally. So I, I think that's kind of interesting. But um, Windows Intune 2 offers a, a variety of improvements, but I mean, the big thing, and this was the big missing feature in V1, was just the is just the ability to do software distribution. So, the cool thing about Intune is that, unlike with a a typical PC management uh, solution, you don't ever have to bring the computers into an office and connect them to the to the local network. Um, you just uh, distribute the client uh, over the internet, and then these things are or just managed as they would be in a, in a more typical Active Directory style environment. So uh, the ability to remotely deploy software, you know, things like, um, you know, Adobe Reader or Microsoft Office or whatever, um, to people who work for you, even though they may work remotely all the time and never come into the home office, or, or you're a new business that doesn't have a central office or whatever, 
or you're a huge company and you have certain people that work for you that just never make it into the office. So for that little group of people, we're going to have Intune for you. Um, it's a really powerful thing. And I, I think the only issue I have with Intune is that for the very smallest of businesses, it's a little expensive. It's $11 per PC per month. And I think this is, it's a reasonable fee uh, for mid-sized businesses and certainly for large enterprises. But um, I think, unfortunately, for the businesses that are entering the market, you know, the, the two guys in a, in a back room who have this idea for a business, you know, they're not going to they're not going to really pay for software per se when they don't have to. So I think it's going to be a tough sell for that kind of a deal. But, um, you know, the capability that is there already is impressive. And then version two, of course, adds more. And again, they're already talking about the future, which to me is just crazy. So it looks good. Mary Jo, any insights yeah. on Intune? <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think it was Paul who had this in his post that really got me thinking. You know, um, the way Microsoft's working right now is they're trying to have a cloud version of everything they have that's not a cloud product. Um, and you know, Intune's already a cloud product, but System Center isn't really. And System Center is this whole family of different systems management products. So if you think about the future, um, the way that Windows and Windows Azure are kind of complements and SQL and SQL Azure. What's going to happen is you're going to have System Center and Intune as complements. Um, so it's it's like Intune is the future of System Center when you when you yep. kind of think of it at a high level. And um, it is really amazing that that's the case because System Center has been a product that's only for the biggest enterprises. You know, it's it's very expensive, hard to not hard to administer, but it takes an administrator to properly configure it, run it, um, and Intune is basically a self-management and um, a security solution too, you know. So it's very interesting to see where they're going with this whole, you know, here's on-prem, here's cloud, and each thing has its has its own complement that that um, gives them a really good story, I think, going forward. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to see from Intune, and I mentioned this to them I think last week, was that, you know, some form of integration between some of their other stuff, you know, that they should integrate this into small business server essentials, which is another product that would, you know, serve that same market or with Office 365, if only from a licensing standpoint that, you know, for people who are on both Office 365 and Windows Intune, that maybe they could get a monthly, you know, per PC savings or whatever, you know, they're, between. They're actually doing that. They're going oh, they to are. do that. Um, okay. They, they okay. told me that um, when they did the Office 365 launch um, this past summer, they said, the first thing we're going to integrate with Office 365 is CRM online mm -hmm. and then Windows Intune. So, yeah, okay. you're going to have this ability where you can like go in and like a checklist go, oh, I want this, yep. I want this, I want this. And that's going to help them sell more of it, too. Yeah, absolutely. It makes so much sense. And, you know, for small businesses, it's it's a bit of a stretch to go from paying nothing to paying anything, right, per, per user. But the capabilities you get between Intune and 365, and if you have a very simple server in your little office, like a small business essential, a small business server essentials type server, I mean, you've got the makings there of what used to be incredibly expensive enterprise capabilities, but now available to virtually anyone. So... Uh, again, you know, the pricing can only come down. I mean, I, I, I can't stress that enough, you know, that for the smallest of businesses that they really need to try to think about lowering the prices as much as possible. But even where they're at today, it's, it is kind of an incredible deal for the capabilities that you do get there. The holiday season is coming up and a product that Microsoft doesn't seem to be refreshing very fast. I think this thing is going to be six years old in November, Xbox 360. They're apparently, yep. the, Microsoft's doing a whole bunch of uh, holiday bundles. Is that what they're doing? Uh, for the season again. Oh. Is that what they're doing? Yes, it is. That's, that's what's what, right here. <laughs> uh, you know, I checked out the site called uh, winsupersite.com and it, uh, yeah. it, it told me about these bundles, but I was just pretending. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> right, right. It's the. Uh... <laughs> for the sake of the show, Paul. <laughs> Uh, yes, you are correct. That story was on my site. And actually, it's, you know, every year I, I, I kind of, uh, I wait until Microsoft puts out their little holiday bundles to see what's up, and then I can compare it to what they did last year. I, I think the big difference this year is that they have a lot of game-specific bundles this year that are kind of unique to this holiday season. So, you know, there's a Call of Duty version, there's a Gears of War 3 version, there's a Star Wars version, which is particularly sad-looking in my opinion. But, you know, they have all these different ways of buying uh, the con you know the console plus a connect plus you know a game or two or whatever it is so um, you know this is what you do in the off years you know um, we don't have a big product release right there's no connect this year um, this year is all about uh, the big software releases you know the, uh, there are a lot of games starting with Gears of War 3 which sold 3 million copies just on the Xbox 360 in one week 
Um, Battlefield 3 is coming out next week, I believe. And then after that, of course, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. So there's just a lot of... it's a, it, The Xbox 360 has got a crazy amount of momentum. And I think off the top of my head, if I'm not mistaken, also the best-selling console for the nine months previous and uh, probably will maintain that through the holidays. So, um, yeah, I do a little thing every year where it's like, here's what's available. So I was just, I was interested this year to see that a lot of it was kind of game specific bundles, which I think is fairly, fairly unique to this season. So do you think slapping a bunch of logos and graphics on controllers, that's, that really moves these products. So like right here, you can see, let's see if I get this larger. There yeah, we go. they're not great. Like, Look at these. These are magnificent. It's not nothing like the R2-D2 Star Wars uh, Xbox 360 that I've seen, which also looks particularly weak. Uh, but no, this, that one's awful. This, these actually move product, huh? I mean, they must have high profit margins considering. It's like, okay, we have the technology. Uh, we're going to put a label on well, there's, it. Well, there's a couple of things in there that hint at the future, right? So there's a remote that's a media remote that only costs $20. It looks beautiful. It's styled like the new S stuff. It's black and everything. Uh, um this is going to be nice for all that live TV stuff that's coming out this holiday season. And then there's also a 320 gig hard drive, which is very interesting because right now, I don't know how the heck you would fill up a, an Xbox hard drive these days. I mean, you could install every game you owned and you would never fill up a 250 gig hard drive. But I think the thought is that people are going to need the storage space for all of this media that they'll be doing through the console now. And so they're starting to bump up the capacity on the hard drive as well. So in the, in the past, you could make this argument that you know, uh, buying a hard drive was just for the people who got the low-end version of the console that didn't have a hard drive. But now you could, you know, with the new version for the first time, you have a hard drive upgrade that makes sense even for those people who do are already have a hard drive and they just want more capacity. So And a convenient hard drive transfer cable that's also available for $19 right there. Yeah, although you get that. Uh, I believe you actually get that with the hard drive, too. And uh, is this, 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 this can't be right. Microsoft's doing HDMI cables? Thirty nine dollars, <laughs> forty bucks. Yeah, forty bucks. I buy cables at Amazon for about two dollars a piece, and um, they were great. I would just remind people, by the way, that the signal is either on or off. <laughs> you know, yeah. that there's no, um, it, the gold tip is not going to provide a, you know, a difference. I'm 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 just flabbergasted by a forty dollar um, Microsoft cable, a cable. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's, and it's an HDMI cable. an Apple logo on it, I think it would sell. But, uh, <laughs> if it was white and it had a little yeah, gray logo on it, yeah. It was, it was the thinnest it, HDMI cable ever. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, actually, that would be really bad because that probably means it'll break apart somewhere. You, you want these to be a little bit meaty. Um, you, you know, the, uh, the other Xbox um, announcement that was this week that Paul didn't really address here, but um, it was the thing they did with Sesame Street and um, National Geographic for the Xbox. I, so they're, they're going to be able to... Sorry? I didn't even know about it. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty interesting because it's try, they're trying to go after an even wider demographic with the Xbox now. So, you know, they've already been saying for a couple of years, we want to get people who aren't the traditional hardcore gamer, right? So they introduced a lot of um, kind of more casual games, family games. But now they're going after preschool kids. Two for the Xbox. <laughs> Which sounds terrible to say it that way, but <laughs> go after. Uh, you can never target. start. Yeah, after never either. start gaming too early. <laughs> and and so they're actually combining Connect um, with Sesame Street. So you're going to be able to have um, this thing where kids can interact with Elmo and Cookie Monster. And um, with National Geographic, they're doing some things around the Connect also. Um, so it's it's interesting to see. They're really really trying to broaden the the opportunity and the market for the Xbox beyond. Um, anything that they've ever done before. You know, if, if you're into sports, you can sign up for the sports packages. If you're into casual games, you can sign up for that. If you've got kids, sign up for this, add the Connect. So they're really thinking, you know, let's make this the true universal console for the whole household, whoever's in the household. So that's nuts. So, oh, so a kid it. can talk back to Ernie or Elmo or something, and Ernie will actually respond to you. So it's not like back when I was a kid. I used to watch Sesame Street, and they'd ask you a question, and you'd say something back. But obviously, it doesn't work that way. But now the television's actually going to start talking to them. I mean, it, it's been weird enough with video calling. I do this with, with when I'm on, like, this network, and it's running at, at, at my house. My kid watches me. So this is going to be very odd. The television's complete. This will be a very different experience. Like, think of every Dora episode. Can you see, can you see Paul? <laughs> they often do. <laughs> Paul, like, it's going to be like that. So it's, oh, wow. Listen, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my kids were young enough that 
I went through that Dora phase, and I got to tell you, I am emotionally scarred for life because of that show. So, no, I, I, that is something I don't want to consider for the Xbox 360. But at why least, can't we just shoot things? I don't understand why this has to be complex. <laughs> well, no, then you learn all the waving ahead of time, so you can you can teach your kids all kinds of things via Sesame Street, I, and eventually they'll transfer to Halo. They speak it to each other in <laughs> exactly. Spanish now because of this show. You know, I just That's don't. Good. That's a good thing. <laughs> it's good for mental development. <laughs> Come on, Paul. You, got, you want to make sure your kids' brains are powerful enough to handle all these things. Plus, don't forget, kids under two, by the way, shouldn't be watching TV according to the study. That's a whole other aside. I guess this doesn't count because it's interactive, right? It's interactive. There you go. This is playful learning, as Microsoft calls it. Playful. So they have what, the Connectimals, that animal game where you can, yep. you can virtually pet an animal, and now you can talk to Sesame Street. And that's kind of that's, – that's, it's get them early. Get them hooked because they're, the next Xbox, the rumor is 2013. I don't know if anybody's seen this. It's the Xbox 720. There was a joke about it in the movie Real Steel, where, yeah. which is basically Rock and Sock and Robots, the movie. But the point is, and, and one, of the, one of the stadiums, there's the big Xbox 720 logo that's up there for like about a minute. So is it, you guys put any credence into this idea that there will be an Xbox and the next one would be called the 720? I don't I try to ignore Hugh Jackman movies. Um <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I think there has to, obviously there has to be a next console. You know, it's not, it's like the thing I said earlier, you know, this is the last video console they'll ever make, you know. Um, I, there will be another console. You know, there are new HD standards that are being ratified and, and there'll always be new capabilities. I mean, even right now, I would say, I think we've hit the point where the Xbox 360 is at its limit for what it can do from a graphical perspective. Um, there was a game, I think it's the game Rage by id, if I'm not mistaken, actually ships on three discs because, you know, the Xbox 360 is still limited to its DVD drive. It doesn't have a, um, you know, a higher capacity optical drive, let alone, you know, some of the capabilities that might be present in, say, something like the, the Sony PlayStation 3. So um, I don't, I have no idea on timing or the name. I, I can't imagine they'll call the next one the 720, but, um, but you know, obviously. 720 has been the been the rumored code name on yeah. that for I think years. It's like yep. everybody's been talking about Xbox 720, and I, you know, I I don't know if they'll call it that either. But 2013 seems right. I mean, timing wise, doesn't it? That's yeah, like Xbox be what eight years old at that point. Alex and I were discussing yeah, how they, old this machine is already. Thirty six years. When old. when when Microsoft, I'm sorry, when the Xbox 360 hit the five year mark, Microsoft said that they were halfway through, which I knew was an exaggeration because. You know, in that Connect, I think it was they were talking about how Connect was going to double the lifetime of this thing, and anyone who's used the Connect knows that if anything, it's probably going to shorten the lifetime of this thing. But I think that eight years does make sense that they could um, possibly, I mean, you know, get another couple of years out of this thing. Although you have to think it's it's we're at a high point. Literally, right now, I would say from a software perspective, it's going to be the highest point ever for the life of this console. Um, but it's got to go downhill from here, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, um, I, I, I'm sure they, they have to be already working on this. They have to be. See, that's the thing. I, I, again, Alex and I were discussing video games and the concept. I thought the Xbox 360 could probably keep going for the longest time because if you can stream games right to it, if all the work's being done offloaded on other servers, I mean, if it's kind of mm. like that on-live experience, this thing continues to be useful because the Xbox controls still work and you could, you could basically stream the games without needing a really powerful machine. So why would the 360 ever be redone or the 720? That could be the last one because it's future-proof. Hmm. Nobody. Look at the reaction. I love this reaction. Mm. <laughs> Ponder. Ponder the on-live future. You've got to be careful with the absolutes. But I... Yeah. I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I on-live certainly... I mean, I, I don't think on-live has been a huge success story, but it it is certainly a proof of concept of sorts, right? That that kind of thing is possible. You know, the online har hardware, or you uh, do it through your PC, is not, you know, the, the client stuff is not a big deal at all. And they do deliver very rich, you know, modern video game experiences over the wire. So it's certainly possible. Um, I don't know that we have the infrastructure in this country in particular to handle that kind of thing on the scale of an Xbox, but, you know, maybe that's what happens down the road too. And that is part of it. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. I mean, you know, the Xbox 360 is still behind the times in some ways. They make it very difficult to move your profile around from machine to machine. Uh, they make it very difficult to, and actually impossible, to buy new games electronically only. Like, why can't I just 
buy a game online associate it with my account and have it be available on any Xbox to which I log on to you know there those things to me are far more basic than the next generation of games you know streaming over the internet so it seems to me like they have to get their house in order a little bit before they can move on to that stuff. And maybe that's something they work on over the next couple of years. Wait a second, Paul. You want things to work conveniently where you can buy it once and <laughs> access know, it not. anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I'm, like a, a, I'm a dreamer. Wow. Mm. That, yeah, he's such an optimist. What, I mean, I mean what, <laughs> geez, I can't believe this. You're looking for a utopia. I, uh, uh, <laughs> I cannot believe that. that. that my, I, I want my stuff to work. <laughs> you know. Just, <laughs> maybe if they just slap on plays for sure for it, it'll work everywhere. I want it to play. I do want it to play for sure. <laughs> Everywhere except on Microsoft products, because that was a that was a fun little <laughs> side note yeah. in the history of Microsoft. Where plays for sure. You guys remember plays for sure, I, I, I yep. assume. And then yep. the Zoom didn't use it, I believe. That was right. that was fun. Right. Did not. Yeah. yeah. I, I, rec I recall that uncomfortable decision with the the guys from Zoom. Um, and my incredulous response to that little bit of news. Is, is, by the way, is the Zoom officially dead? The hardware. Because, I mean, it's been killed a couple times, and then they kept saying, no, it's not dead. It is. It, it is it's like Jason. It's Friday um, the 13th movies, but yes, it is dead. <laughs> okay, good. I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad because now my, my, my Zune is a collector's item. I'm very happy. It is. It's got the awesome tattoo on the back. Let's take another break for another sponsor. <coughs> Let's say you had a Zune and you wanted to get rid of it and you wanted to get something. Uh oh. <laughs> like a Windows phone. Hang on now. You wanted some money for something. You don't have to throw it out just so badly. Anyway, this oh, episode okay. of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Newegg.com, the place on the internet to shop for tech. Now you can trade in your used gadgets and get a Newegg gift card at the Newegg trade-in site powered by Gazelle. If you haven't heard of Newegg, I don't believe you because, because Newegg is awesome. They're the leading online retailer which prides itself on their shopping experience, rapid delivery, and customer service. They have over 84,000 products, an award-winning website. They equip their customers with information to help them make decisions, such as detailed specs, how-tos, 1.9 million customer views, actually more than that, and high-res photo galleries. So like if you want to buy a hard drive or anything, you can check out their little meter by all the customers and say, look, it's got four eggs or five eggs because you want to make sure your hard drives are working well. Newegg has a new trade in site powered by Gazelle. It's newegg.com slash trade. It gives you a fast and easy way to get a Newegg gift card for the value of your used gadgets. So if you've got an old smartphone or MP3 player, laptop, digital camera, GPS, e-reader, video games, whatever you have, go to newegg.com slash trade. See what you can get for it. Gadgets in over, gadgets in 20 product categories, excuse me, over 200,000 unique items. And uh, you should... Just go, go into your house. I'm sure if you go into some of your drawers, you'll find some of your old gadgets from your home, your office. Go to newegg.com slash trade to see what gadgets, what your gadgets are worth today. Newegg will give you a gift card for the cash value of your electronics. The sooner you, tr you trade, the better the price, okay? Because this is a supply and demand kind of place. You want to make sure, like, if you, let's say you just got the iPhone 4S. You want to get rid of it already? Probably going to get a lot of money for it. Uh, go to newegg.com slash trade to check it out. As Newegg says, take it from a geek. That's newegg.com slash trade. And speaking of the iPhone 4S, they sold a, a heck of a lot over the past uh, week. Apple sold 4 million iPhone, phone, iPhone 4Ss, which I assume would be yep. a great number for almost any device out there. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think of this, considering everyone thought, hey, the 4S, it's, it's kind of looks the same. Boring, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, this proves my theory that Apple fans will buy anything. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it is kind of amazing. I... I any other company that released a product like this, you know, if Microsoft did this, right, you know, Apple fans would still be making fun of it. And it's interesting. I mean, um, Apple is such an unassailable force. I mean, I, 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 they are beyond reason at this point. I don't even, uh, I, there's no way to know how to explain it. I mean, we'll see how it goes in the long run. I, I do think that the iPhone 4S is a great upgrade for people who are on the 3GS. And of course, those people are coming off of their two-year contracts, and this is the right timing for them. So it seems like that's largely what this product is aimed at. But it's, it's I, I think the disappointing thing about the iPhone 4S that is kind of hard to ignore is just that it, it lacks a lot of the next-generation features that the competition already has. And uh, whether Android, and uh, to a greater extent, Microsoft can take advantage of that remains to be seen. But um, now, to be fair, there are a couple of Apple products I think nobody bought, the iPod Socks and the Apple Hi-Fi. Because every time I mention the Hi-Fi, nobody knows what I'm talking nobody about. Nobody knows what it is, yeah. Right, so well, people still use two. that. To, it's good for propping open doors. 
Yes, it's, it's and, good to uh, hold on papers. Um, you know, so, somewhere I think there's a house whose foundation includes one of those as one of the cornerstones. You know, or it's <laughs> I think I think this also proves Paul's point that he loves to make in his blog posts about don't listen to pundits either. <laughs> yeah. Because you know who, oh, yeah. who really who predicted that the iPhone 4s was going to be a failure, the tech pundits, right? Yep. Um, yep. And so you know it's like oh yeah oh this this is horrible nobody's going to want this but you know, you really can't predict what the Apple um, user community is going to want or not want um, and not even just the Apple user community but just consumers well, in general right normal people exactly and and that's yeah. the thing I think we lose sight of uh, I it's funny I I had this thought walking around uh in I'm, I'm in dc you know on vacation and we were we were at a, a, a corner waiting for the light and a guy walked up and he had one of the old ipods you know the um the click wheel type ipods and i kind of looked at that and i thought to myself that's uh, kind of strange it's old-fashioned almost already right here we are just a couple of years later it's not one of the touchscreen things and then i thought to myself you know normal people use things they don't just buy the latest thing, you know, like I, I'm so as a, as a tech person, I'm kind of overly involved in this industry, right? I'm too up to date with all of the stuff that's going on, you know, that for most people, for normal people, you know, you spend two or three hundred dollars in an iPod a couple of years ago, you're going to use the thing until it stops working. You know, you're not going to just buy a new iPod every single year just because they refresh them, you know. Um, and I think that's the thing that we all lose sight of as an industry, as, as, the, as a group, you know, that for normal people, this, the fact that this, this exact same form factor has been available for a year and a half or whatever, doesn't really matter to a lot of people, right? To them, it's still new. And, um, and to them, it, this is still a, a viable and valuable device to own. And I, I, you know, and I think this is just kind of a wake up call uh, for people like me, frankly, and, and people who are involved in technology that, you know, we need to come out of the clouds, I think, occasionally, and, and and see the you know see life the way that normal people see things, you know. And this is something I actually do try to do, but I, it's interesting with this phone because I look at this and I think you got to be kidding me. You know, my my first reaction is like, you know, whatever. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, I know all of the problems that the iPhone four has. Um, but you know, you know, the other piece of this, Paul, is. Um, People buy things because, you know, they're, they're advertised or their friends have them or whatever. But they also buy phones based on when they go into the phone store, what people tell them to buy, right? And yes. this is where this is a big sore spot still for Microsoft, even though they're, they say they're trying to retrain um, oh, people problem. in the stores. But, you know, the, why are people buying the iPhone 4S? Because they walk into their carrier and they say, what should I get? And they say, hey, have you seen the new iPhone? They don't say, yeah. hey, there's a Windows phone coming in um, five months. Yeah, don't buy right. something now, sir. There, there may, there may or may not be a Nokia phone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Um, Wait, you mean they want to well, get the sale then? I, I think it's uh, you know, uh, there's also this sort of um, you know when when Apple didn't release the iPhone 4s or what we thought was going to be the iPhone 5 back in June July, there was this notion that well they're delaying it for a reason. You know, may, this is going to be like this big blockbuster, you know, huge thing. I think it helped build up anticipation, and what ends up happening is they release it later, if you will, a late as we call it, but whatever, on whatever schedule. And it's pretty clear to me, looking at it, that the reason it was delayed as much as it was, and I do feel like it was delayed, was simply because it was the software that wasn't ready. You know, iOS 5 wasn't ready. Siri is still arguably not ready. It's still it's still in beta. But this this was kind of the earliest they could release it, you know. And that this this release is really about the software, not so much about the hardware. Um and that's fine. But again, like I said, you know, there are people who are just were, were just waiting for the next iPhone, whatever it was. And those people, by and large, are the normal people. Um, uh, everyone who made a report from people standing in line said that everyone there had a 3GS and that's what they were replacing. You know, that that and that makes sense, you know, that these people were waiting for this phone, whatever it was, so that they could replace their two year old uh, iPhone 3GS. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see long term. I, I, I think the big issue here is just that the iPhone 4S is, in fact, an opening for the com competition. Android will absolutely take advantage of it. The question is whether Microsoft and its partners can. And, you know, to date, they haven't been particularly aggressive. So I, I hope they use this as the opportunity it is uh, to make some headway. And if, if, they, if, they can't make, if they can't make headway against the iPhone 4S, I mean, that's, that's that, isn't it? I mean, uh, it seems like this would be the time. 
Well, isn't that just an issue of how they're going to advertise and educate the consumer? I mean, if you say that there are certain features you can get on a Windows phone or you could get on an Android phone for that matter, if there are features yep. like that, that's not what Apple's selling in their ads. When they show FaceTime and that's like, oh, it's video chat, that's been around for a while, they're showing yep. touching moments. And when talking about Siri, they're like, hey, look, you can just talk to your phone as if you couldn't do this already with Android and Windows yeah. phone, actually. So, I mean, it's this kind of natural... It seems like Apple's trying to tap into like an emotional reaction versus saying we have better features on this other side. I don't know if that's going going to actually persuade consumers. You guys think that there's? I mean, we've seen the Microsoft ads. Can You're they right. do anything like like this? Where they're like, oh yes. Can they do anything? Can they do anything? <laughs> they need we've seen better <laughs> I mean, they need. It's like Mary Jo alluded to the the in store stuff. You know, they need they need improvements across the board. They need better communication to consumers, however it occurs via ads. Uh, via people in the stores, via incentives for those people to actually sell Windows phones, to actually at least give the consumer an opportunity to say, hey, look, here are the choices. It's these three things, not these two things, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah they need they a really, lot of... I really feel like they, they've got to take some of their marketing money and and use it to for a sales compensation. They have to do that. I mean, yeah. no matter how good Windows Phone is and no matter how different the UI is, and how, you know, it doesn't matter unless you're paying people commissions to sell those phones. And that's, it sounds very cut and dried, and it is to me. It, it, if you're not um, giving the people the money, they're not going to sell the phones. There's an amazing parallel here that I think uh, Apple people should appreciate, which is simply this. If you, went, if you go back in time, uh, 10 years or five years or whatever, and you could say, look, I'm a big fan of the Mac. I don't understand why more people don't use this. I find it to be more reliable, a better system. How come no one knows this? You know, that is the, that's the issue right now that Windows Phone faces. It's the same situation where people who use it can tell you, I think this thing is better. It's a, the superior system. It, here are the reasons it's better. Why does nobody know this? You know, Apple's response to that problem was to start the Apple retail stores and essentially provide these boutique experiences where people could come in. And uh, in the beginning, all, you know, when they first started the stores, all they had was Mac. And um, <clears throat> experience the Mac and, and get some time with it. And, and not in a type of situation like a Best Buy where the thing would be, the keyboard would be hanging off the shelf with keys missing and the screen would have some, you know, pornography on it or whatever some kid did as he walked by. So, you know, they wanted to have a good experience where people could actually come in and see what the thing was like. And I, I don't think the response here is Microsoft needs their own stores. I don't think that's what's going to turn this around. But they need the equivalent, which is simply good experiences for customers to actually see these things and know that it exists. I mean, I think that most people who walk into an AT&T store or Verizon store or whatever never even hear about Windows Phone. So that's why I think, and I think that, that, that's the problem. That's why I think the Windows 8 strategy is so important and the way that the interfaces are becoming quite unified. So if you have Windows 8 start screen, it looks very familiar. It looks like the Xbox dashboard, which looks a lot like the Windows Phone 7 interface. So people, I think, are yep. going to get they're going to get lulled into a bit of oh, familiarity. That's, that's definitely part of it. You know, um, uh, I think Windows 8 is going to be a big deal. And I think when window, people go into a store and see Windows 8, they're going to want it. And when they find out they can get a phone that looks like Windows 8, they're going to want that too. And uh, today's Windows Phone looks somewhat like Windows 8, but you have to think that Windows Phone 8 is going to adopt, you know, the different tile sizes, the different tile colors, you know, the, all the uh, customization stuff. And it's going to be an, an even prettier system while retaining the same, the same kind of usability of those live tiles. Um, I think that is going to drive sales, right? And I, I think people are going to, they're going to like this on the Xbox 360. They're going to like it on their computers. They're going to want it on their phones. I mean, that's, that's definitely part of it. But, you know, that's still, you know, we're talking about a year from now. I mean, something has to happen before then, too. Should we open it up for listener Q&A? Because last time yes. I was here, I forgot about it. This time. <laughs> Aha! I'm paying attention. So the, sure. Questions. Who's got questions? Anybody in the studio audience have questions who just ran away? <laughs> Alex, you have questions. No, nothing. Let's see. I'm going to stare at the chat room until they give me a question. <laughs> okay, so why? Because. Anybody else have an answer? Why? That was why? the question, why? It just says why. See, actually, <laughs> that, must be, that must be someone who reads my stuff because <laughs> I often, people ask me, people will say, in other words, why doesn't Microsoft do this? Whatever it is. I, why would I know that? Why, and why, do, why does it matter? <laughs> you know, it, it only matters that they're not doing it or are doing it or whatever the situation is, right? You know, I get a lot of why questions. Okay, here, here's a good one. Any, any news on Windows 8 Media Center? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> why? None. Bill, why? can you tell us, Bill? When will then be now? 
soon. I can tell you why, okay. because you're Thank not you going to hear that. anything <laughs> until the beta. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and the other thing is, right? Beta Center is actually pretty darn good. There's very little you need to do right now. I think the question think is going to be whether are. they prove it. Yeah, and, and how does it fit uh, in, right? And how does it fit in, yeah. So my expectation is that it's... Uh, you know, it's going to be another desktop app. It's, it could even be an optional install. It could be something you download separately. I mean, we don't we don't know how they're going to do this. We just know that it's going to be there. So hopefully they do improve it. Because it's, it's, frankly, it's been in kind of a holding pattern for a couple of releases. I, I hope they do something good with it. Question from Web8978. Why is there an ad for shampoo on my Xbox? <laughs> <laughs> Does it I talk? can't answer why. <laughs> question, sir. I, I don't know. But I think they probably paid them money. That's probably what happened if there's an ad for there, unless that's a special edition Xbox that I don't know about. Uh, this is one <laughs> yes. of those new new ads that Microsoft has coming. Have you heard about these? The uh, the Connect enabled ads. Um, no, I have not that heard are coming. Of this. Yeah, that's next year. Something for next year. But they're they're trying to change how people interact with ads. Um, so, like, say you see an ad somewhere, and you're like, "Let me tweet that right from inside the ad." Like, I guess some people would want to do. I just. I, I'm, not one of them, but... <laughs> no, no, no. But a million times no. For the same reason that those stupid, the square, what are those things? You take a picture of them, QR it's like codes. you scan the little... Scan. Has, has anyone actually gotten one of those to work ever? The QR code thing? Yeah. Yeah, I've had it, I've had it work a couple of times. My wife was almost... My wife and I were trying yesterday to get one of these things to work. And I was telling her how I, I could never get this to work. She has an Android phone. I have a Windows phone. She almost started crying. It was so difficult. I mean, it, oh, it, it, it was just, I don't, and now. You know where it works? So, you go, go to a supermarket and try it. It works on, oh, on packaged okay. goods like that. You know, so what if you I have a can is, of condensed I, I want, milk. I want connect <laughs> gestures. So if, like if we're watching TV and there's an ad I don't want to see, I can just go like, ah. And then it goes. <laughs> Skip this ad. No, I like I, that. that. That's, a, that, that's yeah. the perfect one. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. That's and if I never want to see an ad from that, you know, a, a special gesture, <laughs> company again. a special nice gesture, gesture, the yeah. one finger salute yeah. to move that away. Let's see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. Does Paul still have the Windows 8 tablet from Build? Yes, I do. Well, that answers that. How did you get to keep that? I have to write a book. You have so to. I have, it, I have it on. <laughs> There's a gun against his head. You must write the book. What is the answer to life, uh, the universe, and everything? 42 40. from the peanut gallery. Oh, pie. pie from Alex. I, I hear it's 64 because of the neutrino thing. Then Could be seven as well. Seven? Seven's a perfect no, number. No, it's eight. 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 <laughs> Eight's the, what's, what's eight? Eight's the magic number? Is that what it is? No, eight, li eight, eight is uh, life, the universe, and everything plus one. Plus one. It's eight on its side is infinity, so that's the answer. There we go. And next year, Windows 8. Mm -hmm. There you go. So. Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 one day. And uh, will Zune HD continue to work with the Zune software? Yes. Yep. Yes. That was easy. Even I knew that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many questions do you guys usually take? 200. Not many. 200, okay. Okay, <laughs> only 194 more to go. I don't know if you're seeing this, but Bill Gates is getting very animated behind you for some reason. Well... Let's see. Yeah, there you go. I mean, this happens <laughs> a lot, actually. Angry. He hangs out with me just to irritate me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the top Windows phone on the market? I assume it's the Samsung Focus, um, but I don't know that I've ever seen any statistics on that. I, but I, I believe it would be the Samsung Focus today. We don't even know how many phones have been sold. We don't know that. Yeah, number. it's got to be somewhere in the 160,000 range. It's, <laughs> it's really kind of sad. It's going to be the N800. That's going to be the best one. Hang on till next week. Don't even. If I do think the Nokia stuff is going to make a big difference. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't know what what Nokia is going to do different because I know they actually have access and they can change Windows 8, uh, Windows Phone 7. That is, if they want to. I don't know why they would. Mm, I don't think it's so much that they can change it. I, I think that they can impact the development of the software. So I, I, I think they'll have unique things on their phones. And then I think they'll also develop some things that you'll see across the, you know, the portfolio of devices. Shall we go it's to... Like maps, maps, camera. Yeah, camera. yeah. The map stuff is going to be incredible. That, yeah. that could be a big deal. Shall we go to the picks now? Unless you guys really Absolutely. want to take some more questions. Because one guy says howdy with a question mark. So <laughs> I don't really yeah, the want to answer is, that. Yes. yes. The answer That's is why. <laughs> exactly. So, Local Scout, apparently, yes. tip of the week 
Local Scout is perhaps the single best new feature in Windows Phone 7. Point five. Why yes. is that? Well, I've been traveling a lot lately, and one of the neat thing, one of the neat features in Windows Phone 7 is this local scout thing. You, you can access it through the Bing app, but you can also access it as its own app. And what it does is, you know, he's going to show it to you. Um, yeah, I can. Once I figure it, out. What it does is examine your location, and then it provides you with a list of things that are near you in these health categories. So, for example, uh, you know, my wife and I right now are in Washington, D.C., but I, I used this in, uh, recently in London, in That's Paris. Like, what am I supposed to do with this thing? Seattle. Go oh, scroll down to the bottom, probably. Scroll down to the bottom. Is there a local scout thing in there? Hit the search button. Hit the search button. Thank you. Right, search. And then I hit this button here. The left. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So what this will do is look at where you're at, and then it will provide you with a list of uh, restaurants, uh, sites, you know, and other things that are near you right now. Yes, right now, so if, you, if you want to be near you, me, you can hang out at Pazzo next door. Yeah. Well, they can hang out there. They don't have to be inside, but... <laughs> so, Local Scout is obviously useful when you're out and about in the world, but I I've actually found that it's interesting even when I'm in places that I know a lot about because some of the stuff it comes up with are these places I've never heard of. And so, it's, it's just a neat little integrated experience for all of the stuff that is near you right now. And that, to me, is an, a, a, an incredibly useful... Thing for a cell phone to have because of course on your phone you have the capability to do searches for restaurants you might you could download an app for like you know yelp or foursquare or whatever it is and find things that are nearby but this provides it all in a just kind of a nice single location yeah, and it's pulling from bing so you don't have to update this thing at all do you i mean it's just it's always pulling no you don't you know no you can contribute to it i mean you can you know provide reviews or say hey this thing's wrong you know the address is wrong Location is wrong, phone number is wrong, whatever it is. You can change things, or you can hopefully change things. But so um, you, you found it to work pretty well, because I've got, I've got one reader who, he keeps trying to use it. He's based in New Jersey, so you'd think, you know, he'd, he'd be in an area where there'd be local oh, scouts. I, so the problem so. is he's in New Jersey. Yeah, there's nothing to do in New <laughs> no. Jersey. <laughs> That's no, the problem. I, so it's looking for stuff nearby. Yeah. It's going to say, go to New well, York. Like I said, at this point, I mean, I, we, I used it in Anaheim when I was at Build. I used it up in Seattle. I used it in the Fort Collins area in Colorado. I used it in Paris and London. I used it, I'm using it now in Washington, D.C. And this thing has been incredibly, incredibly useful. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and this, is, this, is, this is Windows Phone in a nutshell. It's this kind of integrated experience where it brings all these things together. Because a lot of the stuff it's doing, you could kind of go get different apps that do little parts of it. And that's, that would be the iPhone way of doing things. But by providing this single integrated experience, it has everything in one place. You know, that's very much along the, that's the, the kind of the Windows Phone mantra. You know, this is the way things work in Windows Phone. And um, to me, this is like the poster child for Windows Phone. It's, um, it's, just, it's a great little app. So This should be uh, in the ads. This is what they need yeah. to show. Like, if, you're, if yep. you go somewhere new and you don't know where, what's around, or you just, I don't know, you're a recent transplant from the East Coast, like me, <laughs> you'll be able yep. to find well, the, the place I ate. Uh, we ate dinner last night at a, a Spanish restaurant in Georgetown called Bodega. And the reason we were there is because we saw it on there. We looked at the reviews and we said, okay, this place looks decent. And, um, and we, there we were. So we had dinner there. You start Local Scout by hitting search. And then there's this little button that looks, it looks like it has buildings. Well, by default, though, there's also Local Scout is also a tile on the home screen. So it's its own thing, too. Okay. Uh, by default. Uh, well, he was, might have deleted it. I was told by our resident Windows Phone expert, Alex, to push that button. I never saw that tile. The tile? Hey, and somebody's, Alex, somebody's I never sending saw you a message right now. That doesn't, it doesn't exist. Let's put that away. <laughs> uh, we should move on to the software pick of the week <laughs> because okay. we're running out of time, actually. Okay. Um, it's been. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this one, actually, there were two different people. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the second person's name in here, I'm sorry to say. So two people actually recommended this to me this week. It is a, a new utility uh, from, the or, uh, from the maker of a previous utility called Fences, uh, which is called Bins. It's, it's not free. It's actually $5. But um, it's something to look for if you're running Windows 7 and you want something that, you know, one of the issues with Windows 7 is that uh, you can have all of these shortcuts in your taskbar. But... Obviously, as those things pile up, you run out of space. And what this allows you to do is create groups so that as you mouse over one of the icons, a, a, a mini taskbar will pop up on the top of it and give you the chance to kind of group things, kind of like folders work in iOS 5 or in iOS, if you're familiar with that. So, uh, But right in the taskbar. And this is just kind of a neat way to combine related icons. So maybe you'll have like a, a, like a web browser group that all the web browsers or a Microsoft Office group where all the Office apps are in there. And so instead of having... 
you know, five icons, one each for all of your Office apps. You have one icon just for Office, and then as you mouse over that, uh, you get a pop-up, and then you can pick the uh, the correct app from that group. So um, this looks like a, you know, a, a, kind of a neat little taskbar organizer. And uh, again, it's not free, which I would prefer. If you do want a, a free, something free that's something like it, actually, you should look at Fences. Fences isn't exactly the same, but um, it's it's kind of based around the same model of organizing uh, shortcuts, and it's it, it's a slightly different way of doing things, but um, yeah, something to look at. Yeah, this actually reminds yes. me of what I used to do with the the taskbar. I used to make my own folders. I used to have your customized yeah. toolbars, and that was a long time ago. Well, I used to just do the start menu. You'd create this crazy, intricate, you know, customized start menu. And now, like these days, I just use start menu search where I put stuff in the taskbar. I don't ever go into the start menu for anything. So, but if you want to, if you're if you're icon happy, you could use fences or bins. Bins mm -hmm. is five bucks, and fences says it used to be free. Is it still available? I think you I can think still get. It. You can still get it. Yep. It Free for personal use. So don't start putting it in your business or your enterprise. Yeah, don't put it out in your organization via Windows in Tune 2. But there is an enterprise pick of the week called Rosalind, and I'm assuming that's not Rosalind Carter. So no. I have Mary Joyce place. That's right. I stole yeah. your joke. No, that wasn't my joke. It's actually, if you care, it's named after a town outside of Seattle called Roslyn, um, which is a little mining town out there. Um, but... Roslyn is really interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, one is it's the next big project from Anders Heilsberg, who is the father of C Sharp at Microsoft. And what it is, is they're taking the Visual Basic and the C Sharp compilers and they're opening them up. So right now, the way Microsoft talks about compilers is they say compilers are a black box. You know, you get a compiler, you can't really see what's going on inside. So the idea with Roslyn is let's open up the compiler and let people take advantage of the application programming interfaces that are inside of it and use those to um, interact with. Um, and that's why they call it compiler as a service. It's not really like what we think of when we think of like application as a service or software as a service, but it's more like giving programmers access to what's inside the compilers and kind of see where they go with it. Um, and the reason it's my pick of the week this week is Microsoft made a technology preview of Roslyn available for download from the download center. So if you're curious about it, you can go download the bits. Anybody can. And um, it's Roslyn's not going to be part of the next Visual Studio, which is Visual Studio 2012 out next year. It's going to be something after that. So, you know, it's still a ways away, but something if you're a developer, especially a VB or a C Sharp developer, you might want to go check it out and see where they're going with that. Before we get to our code name of the week, we have to thank another sponsor, Audible.com. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com, which is the pro leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For listeners of Windows Weekly, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you the chance to try out their service. One audiobook you might want to consider downloading is actually Paul's pick. Paul, what do, what do you have as your Audible pick? Uh, this one's called Overhaul. Um, it is the book by Steve Ratner, who's the guy that the government hired to basically usher uh, GM and um, Chrysler into bankruptcy. And so as the guy who did this, it's just kind of an amazing insider uh, look at this process. I, I've actually read a lot of books about this. There's, there's a book by, I think it's Bill Vlasic, uh, called Once Upon a Car, which is not available on Audible uh, for some reason, but that's also excellent. But I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by... The government intervention with the car industry and, and and the rationale behind it and how it worked and kind of the behind the scenes stuff that happened with uh you know uh, rick wagoner in, in particular who was the ceo of general motors uh kind of a particularly clueless guy about uh where he was going in the future <laughs> this kind of an interesting moment where you know they ask him you know so what do you think you're going to be doing in the future and he describes how he thinks he has a couple of good years left in him and he and i don't know if it was steve ratner or somebody else who said uh yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> you're, you're, you're on the way out. Well, for listeners, um, if that book's not your cup of tea, you can always try out any of the other <laughs> 75,000 books. That's available why, at... Why wouldn't that book be your cup of tea? I, I don't know. Maybe they're, they're coffee drinkers. That's available <laughs> at audible.com slash windows. Again, go to audible.com slash windows, and you'll be able to get a free book, and you can try out, well, whatever you want. Let's get to the code name pick of the week, which is not Rosalind. It's Drawbridge, which... Drawbridge. Drawbridge. It's not, a, it's not one of the uh, Windows things, then, because it's not a city. What, what does um, it mean? Well, it, what's really, there's so many interesting things about Drawbridge. This is a project from Microsoft Research that I've been tracking for a while. And um, the reason it's interesting, one reason it's interesting, is the guy who's behind it primarily is Galen Hunt. 
And people who follow Microsoft Research may remember Galen Hunt's the guy who de helped develop Singularity, which was a microkernel that Microsoft developed that is not based on Windows. So in Microsoft Research, you're doing a lot of uh, projects in operating systems that have nothing to do with Windows. Um, so I was curious when I first heard about Drawbridge, I'm like, oh, what's this? Um, so bear in mind here, I'm not a computer scientist or a programmer. I am just a journalist and I'm going to tell you some things about an operating system right now. So you have to take my words with a grain of salt. Um, but Drawbridge <laughs> is, <laughs> I have to give a little disclaimer there because it's, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you my best uh, interpretation of what I think it is. Um, but there's a Channel 9 video. If you really care, go watch that because you'll understand it way more than what I'm going to say. Um, so Drawbridge is an example of a an operating system construct called a library OS. And so a library OS is all about um, virt basically a supporting virtualization for application sandboxing. So the idea is um, enable applications to run more securely in a virtualized way. Okay, so an another concept in Drawbridge is something called a Pico process. Um, th so these are the two components, a library OS and a Pico process. Pico process is um, a process-based isolation container that is based on a minimal kernel API. Um, okay, so you combine these two things and you're wondering now, why is this so interesting? Well, I think, and this is just me guessing here, um, because you know, with Microsoft research projects, you never really know when are they gonna show up in products if they ever do. Um, but if you, if you remember this, Microsoft has been doing a lot of experiments around what would it be like to take uh, a, one kernel away and substitute in another kernel, right? And one of the key places where this could occur um, very soon is Windows Phone 8. There's a lot of people who think Microsoft's gonna take the CE kernel away and substitute in the Windows uh, kernel itself. So they're doing all these experiments with things like Drawbridge um, about what would it be like if you could run all these applications virtually um, and not have to worry about underlying operating system. It would give you a way to protect legacy apps um, and enable them to run on whatever kind of operating system with that, whatever kind of chip you've got going. So I, I think I'm, uh, it's going to be real interesting to see where they go with Drawbridge and how that gets incorporated into possibly things like Windows Phone 8 or maybe Windows 9. Um, so keep keep your eyes peeled for that one. I think I think we're going to see something good come out of that. I think that's going to put it put it a, a wrap. We're going to wrap up this episode of Windows Weekly. Paul and Mary Jo, thank you guys. And, and Bill, Bill, thanks for being here. Look at him, look at him. He's relaxing. He's, yeah, he's, See, he was, he was just kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. He was relaxing. He enjoyed the show, I think. And I, I really, guys, thanks for, uh, for walking me through the episode. This was uh, this is lots of fun <laughs> to talk about everything to do with Microsoft. Paul, any, anything you'd like to promote other than your vacation in Washington, D.C., so people can stalk you? <laughs> Well, uh, no, but thank you for that opportunity. And thank you for being here this week. I appreciate that. Yep, no yes. problem. Mary Jo? Really nice to have you. Had nice to have you as our guest host again. Um, and uh, the only thing I'll promote is I'll say stay tuned for lots of good coverage next week from Nokia World. That's right, next week. Real. Right. These guys will be back. Bill will probably be here, depending if Alex wants him to be there. And Leo <laughs> will be sitting over here in an evil chair. So thanks for watching, and we'll see everybody next week on Windows Weekly.